Hi everyone, this is Peter. And uh, in this um, lecture, very short lecture, try to keep it not too much over 10 minutes. I wanna just talk briefly about one of the most important contributions uh, of the Byzantine era. Um, that's a long one, by the way, we're talking really pretty much close to a thousand years uh, when all is said and done. But one of the most important contributions of the Byzantine era to world art, and that is actually in some important ways, the foundation of painting, um, especially portable paintings, the kind that many people are used to thinking of as uh, painting today. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, when we look at the art of the ancient world, and in particular, the art of ancient Greece and Rome, there's a remarkable shortage of two-dimensional artworks um, involving what we would typically uh, consider painting. To, to take the earlier example, that of ancient Greece, hardly anything survives in a, um, you know, in, a, in, in good shape or in any kind of quantity. So a, a history of Greek painting is a, is a, is a pretty short book. Um, some of the examples we find that survive uh, are kind of reconstructions via, um, uh, especially Hellenistic era mosaics and occasionally Roman versions of what we assume are, in many cases, uh, much like the Greeks copied, uh, sorry, Romans copied Greek statues, uh, Romans copying uh, Greek paintings. Um, the conditions of painting in the ancient world are a little complex in the sense that we don't have some of the mediums that we would associate today, typically, with a painting. Uh, most typically, I think a lot of people associate, besides more modern synthetic materials like acrylic, etc., um, we associate painting with oil, but in the case of uh, the ancient world, uh, painting emerged primarily in two uh, mediums. One of them was uh, fresco painting, painting in wet plaster. Um, and, and we really didn't have a good sense of what, for example, the Romans were up to in that regard until um, some serious excavations are undertaken in Rome, but most importantly at Pompeii and Herculaneum in the 18th century. So the, the sort of knowledge of ancient Roman painting in, in, you know, in the mural sense of fresco is actually quite limited. And the other uh, example, uh, which is um, again, not necessarily widely known, but, but the tradition seems to have passed down um, is uh, painting in what's called encaustic, E-N-C-A-U-S-T-I-C. And encaustic is basically painting with colored wax. Um, and the, um, the icon that we're looking at right now uh, from Mount Sinai, the Monastery of St. Catherine uh, from the 6th, early 7th century is probably reflective of practices that may go back all the way to um, the end stages of ancient Egypt. We have what's called a, you know, a number of these Fayum portraits, F-A-Y-U-M, basically portraits uh, that would be uh, inserted into a mummy casing to, in essence, substitute for the, the face of the, of the deceased. So um, when we start looking at the development of painting, particularly portable painting in the West, we sort of, uh, you know, kind of start the story in the, um, you know, basically in the sixth century. Um, another place that uh, this emerges, which I'm not going to go into right now, um, similar but not quite, would, would obviously also be illuminated manuscripts. And I think the sense of interaction between illuminated manuscripts and, and icons is, you know, there's definitely something going on there. One of the headaches for people studying the history of this particular aspect of Byzantine art is what's known as the iconoclastic controversy. And iconoclasm, I-C-O-N-O-C-L-A-S-M, iconoclasm is, is basically pretty much literally a, a Greek word. Um, it means the breaking of images, the destruction of uh, images. And what happened was, um, particularly as we come into the eighth century in the history of the Byzantine Empire, this is a, a period uh, where Byzantium was under a very high degree of stress, um, particularly from the incursions of Islam at this period. A religious controversy began to emerge, and this may indeed have been 
to some degree uh, stoked by the uh, Islamic tradition of an aniconic religious practice, aniconic, A-N-I-C-O-N-I-C, refers to not having uh, images in religious practice. Um, if we refer, for instance, in the uh, Hebrew Bible to the Decalogue, the so-called Ten Commandments, the second commandment is not to make images of anything. As we come into the um, the eighth century, um, a, a, a theory emerged espoused by, among others, Emperor Leo III. And this is the uh, first few decades of the eighth century. He reigned until 741. That one of the reasons that the Byzantine Empire was under so much uh, pressure and losing um, militarily, etc., to Islam was because of this extensive culture of what could be construed as idolatrous uh, imagery. There are lots of other dimensions to this, but the long story short is that um, within Byzantium, a great number of uh, images were, were destroyed and um, actual physical violent conflict emerged as well. Um, regardless, this makes it hard to accurately trace back um, you know, beyond a few survivors at relatively remote locations, like for example, the monastery of St. Catherine, which is far out in the middle of a rocky desert uh, in Egypt and hence less likely to be um, you know, attacked and its contents destroyed. Trying to reach back farther into time with icons is, is, is quite hard because of that. And that's always a thing to think about when dealing with uh, art from any period, even relatively recent uh, periods, the destruction of of the historical record, uh, particularly by uh, war, um, is is always a problem. So if we start working with this, this is a great example of um, a relatively um, you know modestly sized uh, icon. This is um, just over two feet in height. Um, this is a very typical size for icons, and, and icons have a number of locations. One is at a so-called iconostasis, which is in essence a kind of dividing wall between the congregation of an Orthodox church and the uh, priest who might be conducting the service. So there'd be a, a kind of wall-like structure that would hold these images um, to be uh, viewed by the, by the um, uh, worshipers. Um, that's one location. Another might be, for example, you know, because of the small size of this, um, you know, could be easily hung up in most people's uh, uh, houses, for example. So there's a potential domestic and devotional aspect to icons that's quite important. And indeed, in the Byzantine tradition, a very direct and almost physical interaction uh, with icons uh, was encouraged, which for Western Christianity was seen as um, curious at best and problematic at worst. Um, and that's one of the many differences that begin to um, begin to uh, emerge. Kneeling down uh, to show <clears throat> a kind of deep respect for the personages depicted in the icon. I think it's uh, proskinesis. And then um, also kissing icons. This is, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, uh, indicates or illustrates the power of imagery within uh, orthodox practice. It's not to say, of course, that in the West, there's no, there certainly is no shortage of examples of people having the, you know, this deep belief in the power of images, but there's no question that within uh, the Eastern tradition, there's a, a, perhaps a more direct involvement. It is important to understand that an icon is intended to act in a sense as a channel uh, for a, you know, a, uh, a pious worshiper of the saint, or as we're looking at in this particular case, uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, as the Theotokos, T-H-E-O-T-O-K-O-S, the bearer of God. So she's holding the infant in her lap. Um, that, that image acts as a kind of, again, a channel or a conduit to a spiritual realm. One that's really beyond um, and it's in important ways different from our own. And we can kind of begin to see this in action. Let me just see if I can zoom in a little bit here to get a, a better sense of that. You can see in the, in the picture, we're just gonna focus primarily on the Virgin Mary and child. The sense of there not being quite 
op they're not operating in quite the same time and space as ours. Her uh, the modeling of her head clearly shows light and shade, but her expression is somewhat otherworldly. And you can see in the saints flanking her that kind of abstract and open stare that is not uh, reflective of typical uh, human expression and has a, a, a sort of timeless and eternal quality to it. Um, other typical aspects of icon representation um, are a certain degree of really profoundly two-dimensional depiction. You know, there's a hint here of columns of legs and and so forth, but as you go farther down, you can see that the feet, and this will become more and more exaggerated, particularly in mosaic decoration, the feet are sort of very symbolic, just these two little points, proportions become less and less uh, realistic. So the overall impression within an icon is of a time and space removed from that of the viewer that one gets a certain degree of access to through interaction with the icon, but that is not intended in any real sense to reflect the conditions, visual or otherwise, that the, that the worshiper, the, the viewer, um, exists within. The icon also has um, a, a kind of um, very prescribed um, appearance. That is to say, once a, a kind of standard pose or character is developed, um, people who make icons going back many hundreds of years tend to follow exactly the same visual formula. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, one of them might be, for instance, religious orthodoxy. Another a very interesting one is the notion that the icon has a kind of non um, handcrafted, non, what's the right word for this, the, the Greek word techne, that's not made by people. That, for instance, like the famous Shroud of Turin, that it, in a sense, imprints itself upon the surface. So once that you know, that image of, say, the Virgin Mary or something is created, then it's impious in a sense for the icon manufacturer to, um, you know, to alter that in, in, in any way. So what happens is it's quite interesting to see as you follow the history of icon making, the um, consistency over time and um, the relative, um, what's the best way to put this? Besides the consistency, the, the kind of way in which it's transmitted even into, if we look at this piece that's made, um, you know, 6th, 7th century, so fifth, late 5th, early, um, what do I want, late 500s, early 600s, coming forward to a, even a thousand years, and, and there's a lot of history going on that we don't have time in this short talk to go into, but let's just say coming forward a thousand years into the time, of say the early Italian Renaissance, so 1400, 1500 even, um, that the traces of this particular pictorial formula um, still, still persist.